In previous videos, I have covered some of Eric Lerner's models, including his Quasar model and Active Galactic Nucleus model. He based these models on the research that he was conducting on plasmoids in order to create a fusion reaction and ultimately generate power. So it is with great pleasure that I was able to speak to Eric about not only this project, but cosmology as well. Many of you will know Eric from the plasmoid and the quasar models that I've done in the past, but he is also well known for having written a book on how the Big Bang never happened. And of course, he's successfully run a plasma lab looking at the creation of fusion energy. But what I would like to actually start with is pulling you right back to the beginning. So were you always interested in science from a young age, Eric? Yeah, I was pretty much uh, interested. Um, for one thing, I was exposed to it pretty early. My father was a scientist. He was a uh, an analytical chemist. And uh, basically, I actually got interested in this whole field at a very young age because uh, my mother uh, bought me this uh, children's book about the sun and it always struck me this illustration that showed these endless coal trains carrying all the millions or hundreds of millions of cars of coal that would it would take to produce the energy that the sun produced in a single second from nuclear fusion so i was interested in science and uh, in the 1960s, I started to think about fusion more concretely because by that time I was in high school, I started to learn some pretty solid physics and uh, started thinking about laser fusion. But then in college, this was the era of the tokamak. So it looked like the tokamak had, had solved all these problems. So I thought that for a while, but by the time I graduated, it, it more looked like they hadn't solved all the problems. So that was one avenue of interest, and the other was astronomy. So I had always long been interested in astronomy, and uh, in the period after I graduated, so I graduated uh, back in 68. So in the period of the uh, 70s was the period in which quasars were discovered and studied. And during that period in the 1970s, that's when I became acquainted with the device that uh, I'm now working on called the plasma focus. And I got the idea that the plasma focus process could be used as a model for quasars. So in a nutshell, that's how I got involved in linking the two fields. But you actually ended up then starting your own company, didn't you, to, to further that research? Right, but that was sometime later. So um, what happened was that I got interested in this in the late 70s. And um, I was in contact with two of the pioneers of this plasma focus device, Winston Bostic and Vittorio Nardi, both at Stevens Institute here in New Jersey. And I was able to persuade Dr. Nardi, uh, he very kindly offered to sort of act as a thesis advisor, even though I wasn't in a PhD program, um, to research this connection, and he gave me a lot of the guidance. So out of that came some basic papers linking the quasar with the plasma focus device. So that was in the early 1980s. By the end of the 1980s, that was when I started looking for some actual funding to further this research. And we did get some initial funding 
from uh, in the early 90s from Jet Propulsion Lab. So that's sort of the prehistory of um, LPP fusion, which was then called Lawrenceville Plasma Physics, which is still our official legal name. Um, but we didn't have a lab of our own. So we were doing work with first University of Illinois, um, Champaign-Urbana. So we did our first experiments there. And then uh, in the early part of this century, in the uh, period 2003, we did some experiments in cooperation with Texas A&M. But, but it wasn't all the way up until 2008 that we got funding to do our own experiments. Right. And, and now... And now you have a lab that you actually run with your own equipment and and your own staff right 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 and that was even though i've been working on this effort since these first papers back in the 80s um basically it was sort of a, a one-man show except for these experiments with uh the universities up until 08, and that's when our lab in Middlesex was established right at the beginning. We got funding in 08 privately, and then we established the lab right at the beginning of 09. By the end of 09, we had a machine that was actually working. So we built the machine during 09. And uh, so this would be really the 10th year of the full project in which we have our own machine. Wow. So how, how exactly is the, the research currently funded? Right now, it's funded entirely privately. Now, that's not voluntarily. We'd love to get government funding, but the government has sort of put all of its eggs in the tokamak basket, so we haven't persuaded them to diversify yet. So we're being funded by private investors who buy shares. At the moment, we've got almost 500 investors. And, uh, oh no, I'm sorry, we have a little over 500 investors. And as a matter of fact, right now, we are doing a crowdfunding campaign on the wefunder.com site. And that allows us, uh, during this limited campaign, which runs through the end of January, to raise money from everybody, from ordinary folk, because um, for most part of the year, SEC requirements limit us to what are called accredited investors, or people who have either a million in assets or 200,000 in income. But during these WeFunder campaigns, the crowdfunding campaigns, then we can get investments from everybody. And I just, I'll just interject there. If you are interested in supporting Eric and this project, I will include a link down below in the description for that, that we funding campaign. So if you're interested, you can just click down there to, to go and see that. Okay, so I want to kind of dive into some of the detail um, because, uh, I mean, I, I've read a lot of your stuff and I have to say, personally, I don't think you're given enough credit for the work that you've done, both in terms of the, the, the fusion, uh, the plasma fusion stuff, but also in terms of the, the work that you've done in taking Bostick's work and uh, extending it, looking at the, the, the quasar plasmoid model and then beyond that. Um, but I, I would like to sort of jump into some of the detail um, because I was reading some more of your papers just before this interview, just to kind of uh, get into the detail. And again, I mean, I've covered this in some of the videos, but there, there basically is when the plasmoid forms, there is an, uh, once it becomes sort of active, there is an asymmetry between the north and the south poles. So you have the, the one of them becomes an electron beam and one of them becomes a proton beam. And the, the concept is that the electrons heat the plasmoid electrons, which in turn heat the ions, and this ignites the fusion. And the energy is then released through bursts of X-rays from those heated electrons in the plasmoid, 
but the one thing that I was a little bit confused about in that is, is, is and maybe you can sort of help explain that, is, is how those yeah. electron beams uh, cause that initial heating of the electrons in the plasmoid. Well, we've sort of modified that idea over the years. In other words, um, we've always, we were puzzled initially by how efficiently the heating seems to go on because it looks like the, until the plasmoid gets very dense, it looks like the electrons can escape very easily. So actually there was an idea from quite another direction that occurred to uh, a scientist, Malcolm Haynes, uh, over there in the UK. And he was studying a somewhat related machine, which was the big Z machine in uh, Nevada and no, New Mexico. Anyway, so the Z pinch is sort of similar to ours in the sense that it uses the magnetic fields that are produced by the currents flowing through the plasma. And what they observed was this sudden heating, just like what we observed. But he attributed it to what's called viscous heating. So viscosity in plasmas and just like in molasses or honey is a way of turning organized motion into random motion, the sort of motion that can cause high energy collisions between particles and therefore fusion. And the way I like to explain it is uh, in terms of traffic flow. So when we're compressing this plasmoid, the plasmoid is compressing very rapidly, especially at the end. And there are waves of ions traveling into the uh, plasmoid as it contracts. And you can imagine these as an analogy to streams of traffic. So if you have a stream of traffic on a superhighway and you're on, you know, one side is right going west and the other side is left going east, then you have a lot of organized movement. So the total energy of the cars is very great, but the random motion is very, very low. And that's good for traffic. So imagine that someone has a very poor idea of traffic management. Maybe there's a British guy on one side and an American guy on the <laughs> other, and somehow they switch the lanes so that the left-hand lane is merged with the right-hand lane. Now, this would be a terrible accident for traffic because your organized motion would suddenly be turned into random motion and you'd have a tremendous crash. So that's a terrible idea for traffic, but it's a really good idea for fusion. And that's what basically happens. The viscosity gets very high, it turns out, as the ions heat up and the waves mix. So that's what causes the sudden heating. Right. Now, the electrons probably do their part at higher densities than we've actually obtained because at very high densities, the electrons also produce waves. And these waves in the beam link up, resonate with the with waves in the plasmoid electrons. So they heat them up too. Ah, oh, wow. So that's, that's the tentative hypothesis. Now, um, there may be more to it going on than even those two processes because we observe pretty high electron temperatures even though our plasmoids are not as dense as we want them to be. So there may be a third process going on. But basically these processes 
are partially dependent on the density. So we can observe them actually more easily in these tiny laboratory plasmoids than in the huge plasmoids that uh, occur in astrophysical objects. Right. And yeah. also because of the low densities in astrophysical objects, uh, fusion isn't too much of a, uh, pro uh, is not a big process there. Uh, it's really not a big process until you get to the level of density that you have in a star. And, and that actually is one of the topics I, I do want to come back to, exactly what you just mentioned. Um, mm. <clears throat> but going back to the, 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 what you discovered in the lab, now one of the things you also discovered is the emission of neutrons from the, dan the dense plasma focus device. But in the paper that I read, there, there was still question as to whether that was coming from the, the, the plasmoid itself or whether it was coming from the beams. Right. Well, in the papers that we published in uh, Physics of Plasmas, I think we pretty much proved that they couldn't be coming from, the majority of the, the neutrons couldn't be coming from the beams because of the lack of the, the symmetry of the neutron reactions. So we have devices that measure neutrons that are close to the axis of the beam. So the ion beam comes out and moves away from the electrodes. And in our machine, moving away is moving down because the electrodes are pointed downward. And uh, we have measuring devices, they're called bubble detectors, that measure the amount of neutrons along the beam and across the beam in the perpendicular direction. Now, if most of the neutrons are produced by the beam, on purely geometric considerations, you'd expect most of the neutrons to be pointed, to be emitted in the direction that the beam is traveling. And we don't see that at all. We see equal numbers of neutrons in the direction of the beam and at right angles. And that can only be created by a confined plasma in which uh, the ions are going around in orbits, are confined to a given area. And it's funny, we, uh, we recently had a meeting of the plasma focus researchers. Uh, there's an organization called the International Center for Dense Magnetized Plasma, which actually organizes the 40 or so groups that are studying this device. And at our last meeting in October, which was held in Warsaw, the chairman had had this idea of saying, well, what do we agree on? Of course, we disagree about a lot of details. And one of the things that we agreed on unanimously was that in the larger machines, the majority of the neutrons come from a confined plasma. So that's what we all agree on. The reason why we set larger machines is that in smaller machines, the beam is a more important uh, contributor. That is the beam uh, ions simply hitting the background plasma. Because right. what happens is as you get to bigger and bigger machines, the confined neutrons basically are hitting more confined neutrons, while the beam is hitting essentially the same number of background plasma ions. So the scaling, as we call it, of the confined plasma grows much more rapidly than the scaling of the beam plasma interaction. So that's why the larger machines are producing energy fusion from a confined plasma, while with the smaller machines, it's more a combination of the confined 
confined plasma and the beam plasma. Yeah. Well, just, just so that people understand, what, what do the neutrons actually indicate? The neutrons indicate the fusion reactions that we're now having because the, the fuel we're using in these experiments, which is not what we're ultimately aiming for, is deuterium. Now, deuterium is a natural uh, isotope of ordinary hydrogen. So you find it in seawater as a minor constituent. And the only difference between deuterium and hydrogen is that hydrogen, the nucleus, is a single bare proton. And deuterium, the nucleus, is one proton and one neutron. Now that means its nuclear processes are changed so that it reacts relatively easily when two deuterium nuclei collide at high velocity, a fusion reaction can occur and almost exactly half of that time, that fusion reaction reduce, releases a neutron as one of its products. So that way we can easily measure the neutrons and we can say, oh, twice as many fusion reactions occurred as the number of neutrons we measure. And, and you mentioned that that's not where you want to end up in terms of the fuel that you, you use. Um, so, so far, is deuterium the only fuel that you've used? And what are your plans for, let's say, the, the big scale reactor in the future? What fuel would that use? Right. Well, yes, at the moment, we've only used deuterium. People use deuterium because, A, it's cheap. B, there's a lot of data on deuterium, and it's not radioactive itself. So it's very convenient to use, but it has a relatively low reaction rate. What we intend to do, and this is in the very near future, I'm, we had hoped to do this in 2019, but I think we'll certainly do it in 2020, is introduce hydrogen and boron. Now, hydrogen and boron, ordinary hydrogen, and boron-11, which is the dominant isotope of boron, they react at very high temperature. And what's very interesting is that when they react, they form four helium nuclei, and they release a lot of energy. So four helium nuclei and no neutrons in the main reaction. That's a big advantage. First of all, the lack of neutrons, and I'll get to in a second, it's not 100%, but it's very close to 100% lack of neutrons, means that you don't have to worry about the neutrons forming radioactive materials out of the materials of your machine. That's a big problem if you're using, for example, deuterium and tritium as a fuel, the neutrons that are produced batter your machine, eventually weaken its material, and they produce radioactive isotopes that you have to get rid of. So all of those problems don't exist, and that means our machine can be very small and have a lot of energy coming out of it. We don't have to worry about neutron damage. The other huge advantage is the energy comes out in the form of moving charged particles. You've mentioned that this beam of ions is emitted naturally from the plasmoid. Well, that carries both the energy we put into the plasmoid and the fusion energy that's produced. If it's hydrogen boron, all of that, uh, something like Two thirds of the total energy will go into the beam. And the beam energy can be extracted by purely electromagnetic uh, means, basically like an induction coil in which the changing electric current produces a changing magnetic field, which produces a current in a coil. The advantage of this is that you don't have to go through producing, turning energy 
into heating water to produce steam to run a generator, uh, which is all very expensive. So we can have a very compact and very cheap direct energy conversion. So these two features of hydrogen boron can make the plasma focus the basis of what we call focus fusion. And that can be something like 10 times cheaper than the cheapest energy source we have today. Wow. I mean, I hadn't really realized that you were intending to actually use the the, the electromagnetic energy in that way. That, I mean, that... I mean, it seems, now you say it, so logical, so obvious, because in my mind, I'm back at, as you say, a boiler and heated up. Um, yeah. One of the things I did read, and, and a question for you is how do you sort of contain that, is that you were able to reach, um, was it 1.8 million degrees Kelvin in, inside of your reaction chamber? Which no, is it's the, quite a bit higher. First of all, yeah. your listeners should, should know that... that uh, these plasmoids that we form are quite tiny. Uh, the plasmoids are about uh, 0.2 millimeters in radius and about a millimeter long. And we intend to shrink them further because as they shrink, they get denser and they burn the fuel faster. So they're really quite tiny. Nothing is in actual physical contact with the electrodes, which are of the order of centimeters. But in this tiny volume, for a tiny amount of time, about 30 nanoseconds, we actually have documented uh, almost 3 billion degrees Kelvin, billion with a B, which wow. is more than 200 times hotter than the temperature at the center of the sun. So this is, these are very, very hot spots. Uh, and we've published this in peer-reviewed journals. We think that this is actually a record for any confined plasma. I mean, that is a phenomenal temperature. Is the intention for the machine and, and the way that you want to run it that it would end up being a sort of a, a pulsed machine? Because obviously the way that you generate the plasmoid at the moment is... You know, it, it, it's like a one-off sort of process that, and then it lasts the 30 nanoseconds. Is the idea that you then restart that every time or are you looking to try and sustain that for longer periods of time? That's right. It, it's inherently a pulsed uh, machine. Now, we think this is a big advantage because we're going, we're aiming for such high densities that the confinement time is such that our ions are only going to take maybe several hundred to a thousand orbits within the plasmoid during the lifetime of the plasmoid. Now, by comparison, most fusion devices, including the tokamaks, for them to produce net energy, they have to confine things for hundreds of millions of orbits. So our plasmoids are what scientists call metastable. They're sort of stable, while the other guys have to get true stability. So that's a lot harder. That's why we think we can succeed with orders of magnitude less resources. So as you say, a generator would work just like your car engine, which is also a pulsed uh, engine, if your car is running on gasoline, that is. So just like your car spark plugs fire about 200 times a second to produce power, that's about the rate that a focus fusion generator would run. So it would fire about 200 times a second and each time would produce a relatively small amount of power, of energy, 25 kilojoules. But 25 kilojoules times 200 times a second, that gives you five megawatts of power. Five megawatts is a considerable amount of power. That's enough to power a, a small town or a, a large neighborhood in the city, or to give another comparison, a, a locomotive. So this is basically what would be the final product. 
but it's fair to say at the moment the the way that your setup runs is is obviously at the moment it takes you more energy to to generate the the plasma than yeah. than you would get out but that's something that you're looking to i think in the paper i read you're, you're looking to get to net neutral or energy neutral sometime in the next phase right now it's always difficult to estimate people always ask us well you know when when do you get there and when they look back at our website they said well gee you expected you'd already be here and people ask you know why has this taken longer my basic reply is everything takes longer than you think it does i mean that's you know when you take your car to a to a mechanic he's not doing research on your car but when he says i'll get it back to you by the afternoon and then he calls you and say oh no i have to have it overnight you generally don't fire him and look for another mechanic it's very hard to estimate time even when you've done something repeatedly before and in research we have it we're always doing something a little new so for example we put together we've put this machine together several times the most recent time we put it together with beryllium electrodes. I thought back in May of 2018, well, we'll have to take a little longer because beryllium has some safety concerns. So I thought, gee, we'd probably have it assembled by September. Well, it took us all the way to June of this, of, of this year, 2019, to assemble it. Did we run into any particular problems? No, we didn't. But things took a lot longer. The safety precautions slowed us up a lot more than we thought they would and so on. So when we say, yeah, we think in this phase we'll get to net energy, the caveat is it's very hard to to you know, estimate how long that phase will last. When forced estimated, we're pretty optimistic. We still think we'll get through this phase in the coming year, in 2020. But a more realistic way of measuring it is how many shots of the machine it will take. We think it will take about a thousand shots. And to give you some idea of what a thousand shots is, on a very good day, on our best days, we get eight, about eight shots done. Um, if we're, you know, uh, going full out, we can get as many as three shots done in an hour, with the controlling factor being that we have to download and analyze the data and pump down the vacuum chamber. Uh, but even on our best days, there are adjustments to do, discussions to have, and uh, so that means it takes us about a day to do eight shots. So that gives you some idea of sort of the timing uncertainties. But we do feel we have a path to get to net energy, or as we call it, scientific feasibility, in which there's more energy coming out of the machine than we put into it. Yeah. Um, changing tact ever so slightly, you, you mentioned that obviously the, this, the design of this machine is, is, makes use of the fact that a plasma has an inherent instability. And obviously in the lab, you know, it lasts for nanoseconds. But when you then look at the Quasar model, you know, that uh, you estimate would last for, you know, 100,000 years. Now, the question that I have is, is, could it last that long with those inherent plasma instabilities? Right. Well, one of the things that uh, Hannes Alfane pointed out, now, Hannes Alfane was sort of the father of modern plasma physics, and he made many advances both in astrophysics and in uh, what you would call engineering applications. 
So he pointed out that in plasmas, the plasma velocity, which today is called the alphane velocity after him, that characteristic is pretty much independent of the physical scale of the plasma. So what that means is if you scale something up a million times, you expect the phenomenon to last about a million times longer. So that's what's remarkable is that if you scale our tiny plasmoids that last billionth of a second, um, up to galactic scale, you get, uh, you know, lifetimes up and up in the billions of years. So like, the idea is, and this is what Alphane said, is most astrophysical phenomena viewed in their own scales are transient phenomena. I mean, to give an example of that, I was saying that our little plasmoids only survive about a thousand rotations before they, uh, their energy exhausts them. So these little beams that they produce naturally are essentially exhausting their energy so they can survive. They have a certain amount of energy to start with. Well, if you look at the galaxy that we live in, the galaxy is of the order of 13, 14 billion years old. And its rotation rate is about five times per billion years. So if you look at our the galaxy, the galaxy has only undergone about 60 or 70 revolutions up until the present time. So again, in its own terms, it's a transient phenomenon. It's not going to exist in that form for hundreds or thousands of revolutions. It's going, it would, an, a normal galaxy would be quite different in that amount of time. Now that's a, abstracting from what impact uh, our descendants might make on the galaxy as they spread out through it. But in a, if we look back in time and we look at the evolution of galaxies, they evolve very swiftly on time scales of billions of years, and yet that's time scales of only dozens of revolutions. So the same thing goes for these quasars. These quasars are very similar in duration to our little plasmoids if you simply multiply by their physical scale. Yeah. And I think actually coming back to your point on on, on galaxies, um, because you know I've covered both of your your models, um, both the quasar and the active galactic nucleus model, and one of the interesting things is when looking at that, obviously very recently we've seen reports of, uh, I think there were lenticular galaxies which spontaneously turned into Seyfert galaxies, and you know uh, it, literally within the space of a year these galaxies underwent these huge changes. And, and again, we also see the same with some active galactic nuclei that they've looked at springing back to life and, and they're not really understanding why. And, and when I looked at a lot of those, in my mind, I, I see the pulsed behavior of, of a plasmoid. So for a certain period of time, it would indeed be dormant and then Indeed, it would spring back to life as the beam comes back on. Do you see those uh, sort of that as evidence that underpins your model? Yeah, I think so. In other words, what we see, first of all, the formation of a plasmoid, which is what you're talking about when they're seeing these um, active galactic nuclei, which are sort of, it's just the name they give to the smaller quasars, is a very rapid turn on. Now we can calculate how quickly the plasmoid forms and it's actually quicker than we can see. Our best camera has an exposure time of one fifth of a nanosecond. So that's about 200 picoseconds. And the formation of the plasmoid probably takes on the order of picoseconds. So it's very, very fast. 
And that's probably what they're saying is a very fast process in which these uh, astrophysical plasmoids form. In addition, other uh, experimentalists, we ha don't have the equipment to observe this, have observed the extremely high fluctuations in the beams that are produced by the plasmoids in this device. And they can go up to very, very high frequencies, uh, again, in the area of terahertz. So that's trillions of times a second. So again, if you use the scaling factors based on simply the difference in size, uh, a lot of these observations make sense. Now, it, it's funny to see that uh, astrophysicists are actually taking more and more into account the magnetic fields that have to be used to explain these plasmoids. Um, so I, I do think that there is a slow shift in the field away from trying to explain them with a purely uh, gravitational model. Yeah, although I have to say, in in the case of the 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 Seyford galaxies, it was the explanation or the the thinking that they came up with was that there was some mechanism that they hadn't come up with yet that would allow material to fall in quickly and cause it to come back to life at a much quicker rate than they had previously thought. But I do agree that there is much more when you when you see some of the words that they use, it is it there is a shift that is occurring without them being quite as, as blunt about the change in direction at the moment. Well, I think that uh, one thing that uh, I'll send you as an illustration is uh, a very recent paper uh, that studied the orientation, the grouping of stars in our galaxy. And this is based on these gigantic databases that some of these satellites have now uh, been able to acquire of the exact position of stars in the galaxy. And what they found is that stars are oriented not so much mainly in uh, spherical clusters like the old globular clusters that we see, but most stars are actually in strings. So there are strings of stars stretching far more in extent than in width. Now this particular paper did not comment how stars could stay in strings for hundreds of millions or even billions of years. Well, in fact, it's impossible if they're, the stars are controlled purely by gravitational forces. But if the stars are embedded in ionize, partially ionizing clouds of gas, then the clouds of gas can easily form filaments, which are confined by magnetic fields. And the gas has so much mass that it can gravitationally trap the much denser stars. So I'm really eager to see what people are going to say about these observations, because to me, this is this is a smoking gun yes. that uh, within our own galaxy, magnetic fields play an equally important role to gravitation. Yeah, no, I, I absolutely agree. Is this some an area that you're sort of planning to come back to? I mean, obviously, you, you wrote the, the, the two papers on the quasars and the active galactic nuclei. You know, is there more information from the experiments you've done that you feel might require an update to the papers or do you see a different direction or are you so solely focused on you know, getting this device working? Well, it's not, I mean, in the medium run, I'm sure the answer is yes, we will take better data from these devices and try and apply it astrophysically. At the moment, I have pursued my astrophysical research at a much lower level than the fusion research, which takes most of my time. 
but it's gone in somewhat different directions. So I've published papers on using the surface brightness of galaxies as a measure of whether there is really an expansion of the universe. It's a purely geometrical study that doesn't really involve plasma at all. And right now I'm preparing a paper that I will be presenting at the American Astrophysical Society in January about the question of the production of light elements. Now, these light elements are supposed to be produced in the Big Bang, but I developed back in the 80s, and I wasn't the only one developing such theories, showing theories showing that these light elements could be accounted for by thermonuclear and cosmic ray processes that are going on in our present day galaxy. And in fact, the observations are incompatible with uh, a Big Bang having happened. So I've sort of, to a certain extent, I've diverged away from the, the quasar link that initially started both areas of research. But no doubt I'll come back to it at some point. So, so on that question, um, I mean, obviously, we've, we've talked about the, the energy released and, and you mentioned, you know, that it sort of uh, created fusion similar to, to what we sort of see on the sun. Now, there is this idea and notion of a plasmoid sun. Uh, what are your thoughts on, on this concept? Well, I mean... You're talking about the electric sun concept? Mm, not, I mean, not quite, because the, 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 I mean, I think the electric sun concept is, is different to effectively having a, a plasmoid sun model. I think someone has taken your concept and applied it to the electric sun model, uh, but removed some of the other bits um, and, 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 and gone with that. So I think it, it doesn't end up being... Um, uh, because in the electric sun model, it, 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 you've got an anode as the sun, whereas the plasmoid model doesn't necessarily have that. I was just wondering if you were aware I of it. I guess I'm not familiar with it. But, I mean, what we can say about the sun is a few things with certainty. I mean, people have studied the sun because it is so close to us at, at, in great depth. And I think that the the accepted model of the sun as having a source of energy which is thermonuclear in nature is, is well supported by the evidence. Now, I do want to make a big caveat because a lot of people in the fusion business say, you know, what we're trying to do is make a sun in a bottle. And in a way, that's not true because the sun uses a primary reaction, the start of the sun's reactions are something that's a good deal different than what we're doing because the major constituent of the sun is pure hydrogen, just protons. For protons to react together, you have to use what's called the weak nuclear force. The weak nuclear force is capable of spontaneously turning a proton into a neutron. And that happens very, very rarely. That's why it's called the weak nuclear force. The strong nuclear force is what holds protons and neutrons together in a nucleus. And you have to have both protons and neutrons for that force to function. So when we say it's like the sun, the big difference is the sun burning hydrogen is an inherently slow process, which is good for us because it means that the sun is going to last billions and billions of years. What we do is we take nuclei, at least one of which has some neutrons in it, and we use the strong nuclear force. So that's why we can get reactions in billions of a second and the sun takes billions of years because it's really a different reaction at the start. Once the sun has produced deuterium, 
as a product of this initial weak reaction, then it burns very quickly all the way to helium. Um, there's more complexities to the cycles that go on, but that's basically what's happening. So that's one thing we know for sure is what the source of the energy of the sun is. The other thing is that the difference between the sun and a quasar and a plasmoid is that the sun is what we call a collisional plasma. So if you have a relatively cool plasma with relatively weak magnetic fields, a uh, ion is going to undergo many collisions, random collisions with other ions before it is affected substantially by the forces of the magnetic field. But in a plasmoid or in our, our, in our quasar, where you have very high temperatures, very strong magnetic fields, the opposite occurs. So each uh, charged particle, electron or ion, is trapped by the magnetic field and circulates in little circles around the direction of the field, which we call the field line. And it does many, many circulations of that before, by accident, it bumps into another uh, ion and suffers a collision. So the dynamics of these two types of plasma, or conditions of plasma, the collisional and the magnetized, are very different. So where I think you do see the plasmoid phenomena is on the surface of the sun and going out into the corona. So the corona is the outer atmosphere of the sun. So there, the density drops enormously compared with the interior of the sun and the magnetic fields are very strong. So then we see, and people refer to this, we see the sun producing plasmoids in the process of producing solar flares. And these plasmoids can actually travel out into the solar system and sometimes they hit the earth. And that causes uh, solar, you know, uh, uh, geomagnetic storms that can knock out our power. So in the sense that plasmoids exist on the sun and are created by the sun, that certainly is very analogous to what we're seeing in the lab. The sun as a whole being a plasmoid, I don't see that because its internal conditions as this collisional plasma, that doesn't support the plasmoid configuration. Is that clear? Yeah, that, absolutely, that makes sense. Do you think there are any other things from the experiments that, you know, that you've done since which point to other cosmological phenomena uh, that might explain this, like, for example, FRBs or other such things? Well, I mean, I think as a general rule, the problem, one of the big problems of astrophysics as a whole outside of the solar system is that astrophysicists do not pay sufficient attention to the uh, plasma physics phenomena that we and other researchers have observed in the laboratory. And uh, Hannes Alfein, who won the Nobel Prize in physics back in 1970, famously complained about this, including in his Nobel, Nobel lecture in which he said astrophysicists have so little knowledge of plasma physics that the um, phenomena that they hypothesized could be described as pseudoplasmas because they describe them as plasmas, but they don't obey any of the uh, regularities that we actually observe in real plasmas in the laboratory. The exception to this is within the solar system where our satellites can measure plasma conditions, what we call in situ, in place, 
then a lot there's a lot more contact between, between laboratory astrophysics, laboratory plasma physics, and the astrophysics of the solar system. But outside the solar system, there's like almost a, a, a no trespassing sign. And most of the astrophysics goes on in total ignorance of, you know, millions of experiments that have been done here on Earth. And I think that, you know, you get a lot of sort of, to us, humorous examples, like the whole idea that a magnetic field so many astrophysicists believe that in a magnetic field always creates a positive outward pressure, but that's completely false. That that's, violates Maxwell's equations, because if you have currents running through um, uh, a plasma, those currents moving in the same direction create a magnetic field which attracts other currents. So you get a pinch force, and a pinch force is essentially a negative pressure. It's an inward moving force. Uh, so it can compress things, form filaments, and so on. So, yeah, I think that it's not only our research, but millions of, you know, experiments that have been done here on Earth that need to be applied to the field of astrophysics on the large scale. Yeah, I totally agree. Um, one of the things you mentioned at the beginning is that you did some work for um, NASA and, and JPL. And I think it was a, a study to look at the viability of the concept that you were working on as a means of propulsion for spacecraft. Right. What, whatever became of that work? Because I'd love to see a plasmoid powered uh, spaceship. Yeah, well, we still think that's valid, although there's no question that Developing something for space is a lot harder than developing it for uh, use on Earth. But uh, what happened is at the end of the second experiment, which we thought produced some pretty good results, NASA was instructed at the top to get out of the fusion business, leave it to DOE. So not only our program, but Oh, probably two dozen small programs were shut down. So that's how our JPL funding ended. We we were in the same boat with a lot of people. Now, more recently, NASA has stuck its toe back into fusion. But as far as I know, they're now funding only about one fusion device. Um, so... My, you know, LPP Fusion's general line is that the government should be funding fully every fusion concept that cannot be rigorously proved to be impossible. So instead of picking favorites, which they certainly have done with the Tokamak, they should just fund everybody to the limits. And since almost all of these devices are either compact tokamaks that are much smaller than eater or devices that are smaller than tokamaks we're not really talking about a great deal of money we're talking about hundreds of millions of dollars uh, maximum but at the moment the government is not taking this advice so far it's, it may change yeah maybe <laughs> you know what the government's like um do you see that there are any other potential spin-offs from, from the, the work that you're doing? Yes, definitely. We have a spin-off technology that we are trying to find a industrial partner for, which is called X-Scan, because our device produces very intense X-ray pulses. Um, so you can use those to scan infrastructure because they're so intense that you could actually bounce the X-rays off of the structure and have the uh, detection on the same side of the structure as the source. So that's very useful for things like road surfaces, bridges, large structures that's hard to get on the other side of. Now, there are different modalities that are used to scan 
these infrastructures right now. The biggest is is actually radar. But the advantage of using x-rays is you can get much finer resolution. So that's really important because the key to maintenance is catching something early. If you catch it when the cracks are, you know, millimeters across, you're going to have 10 times less work than you catch it when the crack is a centimeter across. Wow, that's, that sounds like so, a really interesting technology. Yeah, so that, that technology we have proven in the laboratory, but uh, we need an industrial partner to spend the money to develop it and uh, to a commercial product. So we're actively looking for that and we're willing to, you know, cooperate with such a partner. Wow, fascinating. Um, last question for me. Um, what are your biggest challenges uh, that you currently face? And oh, really two questions. And putting, putting a, 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 you know, trying to pick a date, when do you think that we would see commercially viable fusion technology? What would you be your gut feel on that? Well, to take the second question first, I mean, again, timing is very uncertain. It's, it's difficult to predict how fast we will progress. Um, if we got the funding that we needed, I'll come back to that. Um, we think that if everything goes right, we could potentially have a uh, working generator by the middle of this coming decade. Generally, to be on the safe side, we say we will have a working generator within this decade. So that's a, that's a pretty big range. And uh, in terms of our greatest challenges, the greatest challenge is funding. I mean, the more funding we have, the more, the more uh, we'll be able to make progress. Right now, we have a staff, full-time staff of four, and that's two physicists and two people, mainly in IT, but uh, my colleague Ivy Karamitsos carries two hats because she's both IT and also uh, uh, communications, public outreach. And of course, I have another hat because I'm president of the company as well as chief scientist. Uh, so I have to deal with fundraising. So we absolutely don't have enough people in the lab. The only person we have absolutely full time in the lab is my colleague, Dr. Syed Hassan. If we had more funding, even a little more funding, we could have more people in the lab and that would probably double our rate of progress. So that's the critical thing we need. Right now, our budget is 600,000 a year. That's too small. We could easily use twice that. And that's what we're trying to raise through WeFunder. Uh, approximately, we're trying to raise a million dollars through WeFunder. Development takes a lot more money than research. Uh, we estimate the development stage would be at least $100 million. Although we think that if we demonstrated net energy, we, we would be able to get some government funding. So those are the biggest problems. In terms of technical problems, uh, I would say right now we're in the shakedown phase of our new the new version of our device, which we've renamed FF2B from FF1, our focus fusion to be, because we've made substantial enough changes, it really is a new device. And some of those shakedown problems, what we're dealing with right now, are the switches. We, we need our switches to function very rapidly and very coordinatedly. And we've made some improvements to these switches, but we have to fine tune them 
because right now the switches are firing together, but every individual switch is stuttering. So it's not releasing all the energy at once. It releases a pulse and then another pulse, and then it turns on full. And that's very bad because when you have a compressional wave, which is basically what we have in forming the plasmoid, as our animations show, you want the front of that wave to be very sharp. If you've got a wave that sort of has waves in front of it, then the compression gets preheated and you can't get anywhere near the compression you want. So we think we know what's wrong with the switches and we're in the process of fixing them, but that's the sort of day-to-day -day challenges that we have. The, the big overall challenge is that we want to prove that the beryllium electrodes, because they do provide very low impurities, and we've proven that they do have these very low impurities, will allow us to get very good compression and much higher yield. So that's basically where we're going in the immediate future. Fantastic. Well, thank you very much for your time, Eric. It's been an absolute pleasure to be able to speak to you. Uh, I mean, I, as I said before, I, I can't, I hold you in the highest regard in terms of the work oh, okay. that you've done, uh, both in terms of the quasar and this work that you're doing on plasma. So uh, well, thank I, you very much for having me. I, I certainly hope you get the funding that you require. And as I said, I'll make sure that the link is put down below as well. So if anyone wants to go and become part of this, you know, hopefully something that's going to change the world for, for the better in the future. Right. Thank you okay, very much, thanks Eric. Thanks a lot. Thank Take you. Care. Bye-bye.